Hello everyone, this is Olga from the Forest Bathing Institute and today we're here with Catherine, uh, Catherine McCusker from National Trust and today we're going to talk about how you can help your kids connect with nature. So Catherine, about a little bit about Catherine. Catherine is outdoor learning and development and events professional. She is a workshop facilitator and mental health first aid trainer meditation and mindfulness instructor, forest bathing guide trained by the Forest Bathing Institute, and professional storyteller. So, hi, Catherine. Lovely to have you on our podcast. Uh, so, please tell me a bit more about your connection with nature. I know you have a fascinating story um, of your life that I would love to share at some point on our podcast. And I know that nature played a big part of uh, in your life throughout your or all your stages in life. So please tell us a bit about how you connected with nature. Okay, well, um, uh, to try and sort of proceed it down um, to a more of a bite-sized portion, um, um, I grew up on the side of a hill, really. My parents both have a love for the outdoors. My mum's fingers are always in the soil. Um, she also was a keen bird watcher and they just liked growing things. So we had a cottage where they worked in North Wales and um, and my dad loved sort of outdoor pursuits as well. And he used to bring um, the young people who were in his charge out to um, mountain climb and things like that. And when we were big enough, my sister and I, then we might have joined in as well. But we camped outside, we played outside. And I think crucially, and I've done quite a lot of work and study on this over the while. Crucially, it was to an extent where it felt unsupervised. And I think, and we might refer back to that, but it was unsupervised play, free play outdoors. And so I would have fallen over away from my parents. I would have fallen over and scraped myself away from the home. They would have been around somewhere and I'd have had to have got myself back up to get back to them to receive the sucker if I still needed it. But by then I might have sorted myself out. And so I, that's really, really crucial. We can come back to that in further bits along the line. My mum lifted me up to put me on a big high branch to, you know, to be high, high up in a tree. And this is these are the things that we remember. And I put my hand to pull myself up and it was on a dead shrew. <laughs> and so we're like, oh, of course, I was hugely upset, but it was <laughs> it would have been left there by an owl. So it was just incredible learning. And I've never forgotten it, you know. And there's another time I was running down this pedal side and I ended up head first with my feet in the air in a big gorse bush. And so, again, I couldn't get out, so help had to be sought. And I was literally dragged by my feet back up and outwards, but I survived it. <laughs> it was an adventure and I survived it. Um, and other times when my sister and I would pick up sticks and stuff, and there's this, there's a picture, which is why I remember it so distinctly, but these sticks became musical instruments because one looked like a French horn and the other one looked like, something else tram trombone or something so we had a band and we played for ages with that being a band you know so it set the stall really but there is an awful lot of um research done about this very thing so it's the it's the free play it's allowing yourself that presence of mind lose yourself in your own boredom imagination whatever so that you can start to make things up of your own and the ability to be able to entertain oneself is part of that resilience and part of the ability to be able to imagine yourself in different situations or in a desired future place beyond a problem which is vital for development um so then later in my life you know um i remember lying underneath the, uh, it was a conifer, I think. I knew my parents were somewhere in the background, but I was musing, I was dreaming, and I can remember every bit of sense of that time. I remember the bird song that I could hear, the smell, the slight crispness in the air, uh, but, the, but the sort of the beginnings of spring and the warmth that I could smell, and then the smell of the conifer around me, whilst just drifting and dreaming, 
and again not having an agenda really important too then later of course my first heartbreak I found I found my resolve by sitting somewhere outside I was in a graveyard actually and I could see a dead tree and I was looking at the dead tree just going oh my emotions were so overwhelming you know it's so huge and then in amongst the dead tree a little tiny bird was gleaning probably off the branches and the words came to me life goes on life moves on as well as the ethos which I was probably probably taught that it too will pass you know things pass and that there is always a tomorrow and so when some major stuff hit the fan in my life much later in my life where some really serious issues uh, arose um I knew even though the emotions are huge and really they can be quite crippling I knew that it wouldn't always be this way and I knew that it would be a tomorrow and I know it's because nature is in my toolkit for life as is self-awareness and self-exploration but I find solace in nature I always have it's from the very get-go I was you know we would be shoved in the pram outside and left under a tree that's what you know because I'm so old but um <laughs> that's what we would do and um and so it's in my toolkit for life and I find solace and I find the answers as well by seeing uh the natural world get on with things and try and find a way and adapt and and all of that um so consequently I've ended up working in learning uh, with children and um, both in this in a formal school setting and then I got the job as you said at the beginning with the National Trust and um, ran a learning and events department um, in an outdoor property so we didn't we did have an indoor space but it was only ever really to dump our bags um, and so I ran school trips and children who are like year sixes, the boys quite often, who were, you know, they get to um, a bit too cool for school at the year six. And I just, we would see them back off on, on the coach and they'd quite often, well, there would be occasions, there's many anecdotes that we've all got that would help running the, these workshops where they just throw their arms around your waist and go, I've had the best day. And then people would, children would wow. say, whilst on the trip, and we're doing a load of learning because the teachers can only do the field trip if they know that they're going to get certain things met to justify the reason for coming out, la, la, la. But we all know that the, that the gains are so much, much more than the actual learning objectives. The learning objectives are masses more. So, um, and they'd often say, this is just the best day. And it's and it's nothing to do really with the learning, although the stories are wondrous and, you know, and in multitude. There's wow about being outdoors. There's, um, there's the potential danger of not knowing what's around the side of the tree, but that's exciting. And um, there's the lack of walls. There's the sort of the boundaries are blurred and there's freedom. And um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that kids go out of control. Actually, I've found the contrary. If we allow, if we if we help the teachers to understand, we've got it. Don't worry. Just be alongside us. We've got it because they're used to frog marching the children in a row with their high vis vests on. They've got to know where they are, counting them all at all times because they absolutely have to. But we were able to help them say, it's all right, we've got it. We run these all the time, we've got it. And they didn't have to do that so much. Consequently, the children were looking around. They might not have engaged in that bit that we were doing there, but by golly, they engaged in that bit. And they of course did have the best day because they were using wow. all of themselves, you know? And then to we, me, go on, you go. Yeah, no, to me, that sounds incredible because I think, yes, there is so much um, um, control, not control, but maybe structure in the days and how schools are structured now. So it's amazing to see that kids are able to go out into nature and explore by themselves. 
Well, that's if they are brought. And so what we did was we constructed field trips that appealed to the curriculum needs in order that they were brought. But we all knew that that was really secondary to, to them being there. And it would fire them up so much that they would then be engaged with the learning. And I, and I still am engaged with, I don't do that so much anymore. And I also, as you, I think, know, Olga, I also ran a toddler group where I was. And that was just the most virtuous, glorious thing that we did. It was glorious because we, I mean, I suppose, I set it up and so I created the opportunity, let's say, for parents, carers, grandparents, whoever they happen to be, to bring their little toddlers. And then we, the toddlers led us. So sometimes they were fearful and sometimes they were not. <laughs> and um, what we did was we just held sort of metaphorical arms around people to say, let's play. So those were the key things is that we play, we dig down to, and look through the children's eyes and, um, and I give permission for them not to have to do the activity that I've planned. So I might have planned an activity because some people feel if they've lost the ability to play or they've forgotten or they never learned how to play, that you have to have a structured activity. Otherwise, what's the point? So I would always have some sort of learning uh, activity that we would do. But I would also give permission and I'd say, if your child doesn't want to engage with the spider pom-pom craft thing that whatever the hell we were doing, and they're really obsessed with that puddle, let them be obsessed with the puddle, please. You know, that's, that's the point of this, is that you hunker down and play with your children and look through their eyes with joy, wonderment, and the minutiae of the detail. Because they do, they find the tiny things. And, and then you'd see the, uh, the impact and the effect it was having on the grown-ups around the children as well. So not only would the children, especially if the ones that were worried about being dirty, um, we would also you know, say to the grown-ups, see if you can invest in some muddy puddles or some things that go all the way over. Make sure that you've got a bin liner in your car, that you can just decamp all the clothing into that, deal with it later, put a knot in the top. Um, so it all just goes straight into that. So if you've got somebody in the household who's particularly uptight about their car being clean or whatever, just get it all in a bin liner. But parenting becomes so much easier if you're free to breathe, to play, and to look with wonder through the eyes of your children. And then you learn to do it yourself as well. And then, oh my gosh, the, the, the impact that it had, and I know it did because I've got cards from parents and grandparents and um, uh, photographs and they write and they still can get in touch and they say I've had another child now you're still doing Box Hill Bugs and we're not at the moment because Covid got in the way and canned everything and it's all a bit like that but we are looking to try and bring it back because it was so good um, yeah it was wondrous and so that's really because I learned to play free play outdoors in nature I suppose that's why I ended up doing it <laughs> Oh, my God, that's an incredible journey. It's like a circle, I feel, oh, yeah. that you started with a free play and then you went as an adult into free play with children. And hopefully it will continue this circle. And indeed, um, your childhood, actually, I know you said um, generations, um, like you talked about um, Maybe it's like these younger generations are not doing it. But I feel that I had the same childhood as you did just because I grew up back in Russia and I spent three months every year. Uh, in the morning, you go out. In the evening, you come back. You basically, the rule is come back before the, it's dark, before yes. there's no light. Yes. You're at home then. It's like if you need food, it's like you know where the fridge is, but you have like warm supper. But otherwise, it's like breakfast and you are out for the day. So yes. for me, it's, um, it's in very interesting to see how 
uh, you brought this into the aspect of what you you are bringing to the kids now whom you are working with because I feel that uh, this free play concept and how you said that then the children uh, can teach the adults as well that's going to be fascinating because sometimes I think we always think about okay we have to pass something down to the children oh. but actually in fact they can pass something down to us that we've forgotten um i don't know whether you have some examples of stories where you saw actually maybe with your work with toddlers or older children how this uh, experience that children had impacted the family and the relationships in the family well yeah one really good one is um i mean i don't suppose it's quite what you're expecting but um she, this one mum, she brought her second child to Box Hill Bugs because she said, I ended up with two boys. She said, I wasn't expecting that. And um, and she said, God, the energy, you know, what the heck? And so she started trying to say, oh, I've got to get things outdoors. I've got to do things outdoors with these two boys. So she brought the younger one to this toddler group. And the very, very first session sort of stopped her in her tracks. She wrote a blog about it later, which is why I know all this. And um, she said, we we were on our way for our adventure wherever we were going. And, and everybody's had to stop because there was a worm in the path. And we picked it up really slowly and delicately looking at Mr. Worm and ev- immediately burst into song because there's a good worm song and then the children were encouraged to put it in their hands and then we put it gently and carefully somewhere off the path so that the birdies wouldn't get it but that it would have a chance to go back in the ground and she was really impressed by the the fact that all the children came around with their hands out and sometimes I would say because I used to show them um dead dead things as well (laughs) That's how I saw you first in Box Hill. You were showing us dead things. I think that's one of your one of your cards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so the children, they definitely want to have it in their hand. They definitely want to touch it and stuff. And I would have to say again, no one react. Everybody be fine because the children don't have those inhibitions yet unless you put them on them. So, you know... <laughs> you know stuff like that and and they were just so inquisitive and this this lady was so impressed and wowed by something that she wouldn't have should have stepped over or just not stopped to have marveled at and you can see the soil inside worms you can see it going through their little bodies and stuff so I mean that's amazing (laughs) it's amazing and um and she ended up training to be a photographer um, but in at specialing in at specializing, sorry, in outdoors family photo shoots, because also because everybody's free and unselfconscious outdoors. So we know, don't we, from forest bathing, if you try to do um mindful activities, people have fed back to me during forest bathing, they've tried to do mindfulness in a in a room setting. And it's really hard because you can't, you can't, you can hear the, the, the mind is so noisy. But it's so much easier in the woods because you can remain in the moment and present like the children do, by the way, um, because you're engaging with what's around you. You're not having to talk to battle and say, go away, pass left. Go, go. You're a memory. Go. You're just being in the moment. There's so much to wonder at. So in terms of and obviously I looked at this in a bit more depth. In terms of psychology, there's two different things I wanted to say. I hope to goodness I remember them. Uh, one was we I, I spoke at a Montessori conference once about outdoor learning. And the example I was able to give them was here is, I don't know, Benji, say, um, and here he is making a den. And there is a load of psychology around making dens. So if they make a little den, what I would say is can they bring in something from their home that that they choose so he'd brought a digger in and of course the digger if you psychoanalyze it is a representation of him and him and his home so he's brought the digger and that's him so he had to make a den for digger and then oh what's dig what's digger gonna eat i wonder what he's digging to eat so he found him some acorns or something like that and then oh what else is digger gonna need so digger needed he he was gonna need a drink yes he was and so in terms of psychology the fundamentals of life and survival is your food water shelter let's assume that the oxygen is okay that's another conversation (laughs) another day but let's assume that the air is good 
food, water, shelter are the fundamentals of life and obviously um, uh, love and safety. So if you can for yourself provide or your representation of yourself provide food, water and shelter, you're already starting to build that concept that you can survive. And when kids want to build dens and they're just too small for the grown-ups to get in, brilliant. Unless you can really, really crawl down and try and get in there with your child and they have made the den, which you're then looking out because they're small and everything else in the world is huge. And if they can make that den and be able to peep out and survive, it's, 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 it's the organismic sort of need as well as love and uh, acceptance. Um, and so it's your safety met. The second one was, there's another school of thought in terms of psychology, that if we don't walk along a tree trunk, slip and have to save ourselves, if we don't climb a tree and then think, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to get down. I feel really frightened now, but you've got to work it out because you're a bit too far away for someone to come and get you down. You've got to have to work it out and you might scrape yourself, but you made it. If we don't do those things and we stop our children from doing those things, there is a school of thought that says that they will seek it anyway. And they might seek it later in life in terms of promiscuity, drug taking, risk ta other risk taking activities and so on. Unless they've learned to feel that fear and get themselves out of it. And what better than in the woods where really really the worst that's going to happen is maybe a broken bone that's a very good i think perspective to look at because i think we we with our lives modern lives we, we make sure that everything is so rigid and there is uh, all the safety of course we know as guides we make sure that all our sessions are super safe but actually in a way sometimes in a safe environment the best thing you can do is just to let that person explore and even if they climb a tree or you say or just fall off something uh, let them be because it's like something that they would emotionally need in their life later on to as a skill for going on and being a healthy and happy kid in a safe environment that you created at home so give them some space to explore outside of that safe environment controlled environment and i think it's um it's such a beautiful also way to creativity to uh, children expressing themselves i know you talked about how you um the six um uh the the, the school children uh in their sixth year they would be a bit more too cool for school right and um i think around this age you start seeing some behaviors maybe in children that they start um seeing themselves as like who am i and how is the world around me and where i stand in it and letting children in this stage also say it's okay to explore that's fine to you to go out you don't have to like there are not too many rules here just go there and explore uh did you find like for example with this kid that you said hug you after the session and said that he had an amazing day did you find that kids really craved it maybe they they felt different after the session when you you said like kids just play free give give yourself a bit of off time yeah i mean oh gosh there's so much to say um you so you said about the exploring um one of the things that my dad used to say to me is, yes, you you know, put your mind to stuff, explore, be curious, you know, do all of these things. But the biggest exploration, the biggest Himalaya that you will scale in your life is that inner exploration. And we know, don't we, we, that we draw metaphors from things in life. So if you are free to explore in an outdoor setting, say, then you are exploring yourself at the same time. And yeah, um, so there are loads of anecdotes where there was a child who had come to this particular school. He'd been in, he'd been in some sort of um, enclosed care setting because of his behavior, emotional behavioral difficulties. So that he had, um, it, this was the first time for a long time that he'd been in mainstream education and he probably had um, 
other issues. I think he was on Ritalin, so he could have been ADHD. I don't know. But the, the teachers were so impressed with him during that time. We would do a meditation type of session as one of the as one of the activities that we did. Um, and he didn't want to close his eyes. He kept his eyes open, but I kept my eyes on him to make sure that he was safe. And of course, he had a mind them <laughs> as well or a, an assistant. And he really engaged socially as well with the rest of the group. Lots of real wins for that lad. But then others and um, wonderful anecdotes with selective mutes that would come and the teacher would say, well, they won't, they won't speak to you. They only speak to me. And I'm like, oh, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see about how Dr. Nature deals with that. And um, yeah, of course, because I didn't overdo it. The As I said, the, the boundaries, the walls aren't there. The, the overwhelming... Um, sometimes displays in a school although they're, they're supposed to be there to inspire sometimes it's not quiet enough and yet although nature is providing you with so much it's it's what our eyes want to see so yeah of course that child spoke to me and they engaged and they came up with some ideas and and others and others and others and there is a there is a, a chap called Tim Gill, who is an expert in risk benefit. And he helped us at one of our properties develop our play trail so that we just put suggestions of play in rather than you run along here, you swing through here, you crawl through here. Stop it. <laughs> so he was really good. And he said, it's really emotive to say it, but we're raising our children in captivity these days. And how on earth do we expect them? to have the skills and the resilience to be able to deal with all of the, the trials and tribulations that life throws at us if they haven't practiced and rehearsed it. That's incredible, actually, what you just said, because it's um, it keeps on coming to me as you speak, to, um, you know, you tell a bit more about that. Um, the recent statistics for uh, mental health in younger people is actually uh, outrageous because it's been getting worse and worse. And what do we see in terms of nature connection statistics with young children? Like we, um, our parents and, uh, you know, grandparents used to spend twice as much time in nature as we and our children do. So it's all, um, I, I can't say there is a correlation, but to me, there is definitely some connection happening. And I think, uh, as you said, so spending time in captivity, as we can say, too many rules, too many regulations, not enough space to explore and just do what you need to do to be a healthy, happy, uh, expressive child is is quite can be can be a contributing uh, contributing factor that's for sure and um, I really like this idea of you know just let them play not do not put any constraints in just let them do what they need to do or just make sure of course they are safe and not like you know licking any poisonous mushrooms or anything like this but I'm sure yeah. <laughs> apart from it yeah. like it should be it should be all right in most cases but if you were to maybe um, give three main tips for some parents who maybe grow, grew up in the city, they themselves don't know much about nature connection and they haven't had much experience with connecting with nature, going out into the wild. So for newbies, complete newbies, if they want to help their children connect with nature, what would be your three top tips to help their children? Oh God, you're going to pin me down to three things. Um... Doesn't have to be three, but three Can would be, be a good start. Twenty. Oh, no. <laughs> it could be twenty. Okay. We could create the whole, you know, another thing about it, which I think it would be very helpful. But maybe just a few things so that someone who's very low on time and energy just wants to do something for their kids. Okay. Can All can right. get away. So do not worry about your clothes the children need to be free to be um free of angst about their clothes so and you too need to be free of angst about their clothes so that's number one you can get muddy you can fall over never mind we can put it in the wash darling 
or we can, do you know what? This is your oldest thing. That's why I made you wear it. Okay, so you are now free to play. Secondly, don't have an agenda. Don't say we're going on this walk. It's I've looked at it. It's only about two miles. I think, you, you know, you're two years old. You should be able to do it. <laughs> um, if you don't get much further than the car park, fine. You know that you've got an hour or two hours. So just see, see where they go, see what they do. And they might not do much at first because they might be looking to you, crawling on you, all of those things at first before, before they realize. I took my two kids once to the top of a hill and I thought, finally, I'm going to be able to read my book. And there's no roads nearby here. Just play in the bracken. You'll probably shred yourselves on the bracken, but hey, um, I've got a first aid kit in my bag. So, you know, I just went, play, play, play. And they did, they, they annoyed me. They stayed by me until I had to go in and make dens with them. Damn. <laughs> of course, I had a really good time. Anyway, don't, so do not worry about your clothes. Do not have an agenda. Just see what you find out. If you want to run, run. If you want to, to turn a log over, turn a log over and then turn it back and wonder, just have wonder, wonderment. In mind, I want to say, so we'll have to go with it. I want to just say texture. Don't be afraid to touch things. I have got the most fantastic image of a little girl. Luckily, she's in a muddy puddle suit, suit and her mum is complete. She's on her second or third child by now who's come through Box Hill Bugs. So she's completely fine with it. We would often stand in the quagmire. Some children would stand on the outside. No shame. It's fine. Um, they, they explore the way they want to explore. Sometimes it's by watching others. Um, but this child was on her knees in the middle of the quagmire, which was just a massive, big, huge, muddy thing. We'd all go... <laughs> squelch around in it and she was literally lifting it up the mud and squeezing it through her fingers and watching it ooze through her fingers so we were all going oh my god that's amazing so i suppose my third thing is texture texture is amazing and i can say with uh, younger kids especially they just want to touch everything so i think it's just an amazing and amazing book all of them are so um rewarding i think in, even a parent who maybe doesn't have much experience with forest schools or going taking kids into nature it's it's manageable so you just uh, go you don't have an agenda don't get don't afraid to get muddy and dirty and texture so i think we can all start with that it's quite a it's quite oh. a good way to start okay number four or you can replace it as one of the other numbers it's do not say, this is, there's only one no, there's only one not to, and you are not allowed to say be careful. Because if you say be careful, it's a duff instruction. You are instilling your children with fear and they don't really know why. If you want to say anything, give them an instruction that's positive, like put three limbs down when you're climbing. Move one that's and keep the good. other three on. Not. Be careful, because what does that mean? They just think I need to be fearful of something and I don't know what. Oh, that's a very good, I think that's a very good advice to all parents really, because sometimes- yeah. not say be careful. Like, yes, thank you. No, that was really useful. And I think even me as a parent of a toddler, I'm gonna take a few things on board because I know sometimes I go for a walk and I think I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna see that place and we spent two and a half hours in the puddle and I get so frustrated. And if I remember about this, that it's not about getting somewhere. It's not about a matter that I don't mind as much, but just let them explore and just basically chill out maybe in that, in that time as well. Explore. And uh, now I go in the puddles as well sometimes. So that's, um, that's a very good reminder. So thank you, Catherine. And, um, Yes, anything that you would like to share with uh, our listeners, maybe about uh, where they can learn more, because I'm sure many people would love to know where you will be running your next for school for uh, uh, toddlers or maybe older children as well. Uh, is there anything that we, th uh, that we can learn from you further? Well, all our, um, 
all our learning offer has been shelved for the time being. We do it. We've just done tiny bits since the pandemic because we just didn't have the staff. So um, unfortunately, I, I don't really know that, but the, the, the nature is there. Uh, it's all around. And we are going to be putting a like a well-being walk in at Box Hill, just with some just like, you know, so people can just have like a very light version of forest bathing, just some suggestions of slow down touch this you know some little light things like that which if you think you need you're not confident enough to just make it up or that you want some some sort of guides guidance or instructions that will be there and the hope is that by may uh th this year 23 that will be in place at box hill in surrey um and we're hoping to do uh mindful may so we'll we'll we're, we're going to put a load of forest bathing on as well um uh but yes i have to set that in place um i can't do it all sure. no i'm sure you're very busy so that's <laughs> even like looking forward to that would be amazing and maybe when you start you can share a link and um when you have more information and we can um encourage people to try it because i'm sure that many people love to learn more so thank you a lot catherine for being with us today um and um we hope to see you again because yeah. uh, we really enjoyed talking to you. So thank you.